which infest his coat. They're irritating and even painful. And while his huge claws enable him... Dinochirus is the largest ornithomimosaur that has ever been discovered. This giant and weirdly shaped dinosaur lived during the late Cretaceous period, around 70 million years ago. Its remains were found in the 1960s when a joint Polish and Mongolian paleontological expedition made its way into the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. It will be a third paleontological expedition to the country, following similar expeditions by American paleontologists in the 1920s and Soviet scientists in the 1950s. So far, each expedition had revealed amazing new species of dinosaurs and mammals from the late Cretaceous. The American finds included the first fossils of Velociraptor, as well as the first dinosaur eggshell fossils found anywhere on Earth. The Soviets, on the other hand, had some luck on their own, as their expedition led to the discovery of a new species of Tyrannosaur that would be given the name of Tarbosaurus. Initially, only a pair of arms as long as a surfboard were discovered, and for more than 40 years, the rest of the dinosaur remained a mystery. Early depictions of Dinocris illustrated an enormous long-armed carnivore as large as a T-Rex. Further studies led to the suggestion that Dinocris was an ostrich-like dinosaur, technically known as a Orthomimosaur, based on the proportion of the bones of its hands. With such mysteries surrounding it, Dinocris shot up in popularity and became an established part of mainstream dinosaur culture by being included in almost all dinosaur books and media with the other big name dinosaurs. However, in these books, the arms were always portrayed as a mystery with statements like no one knows what kind of dinosaur Dinocris was. And these statements persisted into the early days of the internet and to the early 21st century. But in 2014, new fossils revealed that Dinocris had a unique large hump on its back, supported by its backbones. Now, paleontologists knew how truly of a bizarre looking creature they had, with its huge clawed hands like a sloth, a beak head like a duck, and a hump like a camel. However, the popularity of Dinocris did not transfer over to Jurassic Park, and so it has made almost no appearance in the Jurassic Park franchise, only appearing in three video games. Jurassic World Alive, and in Jurassic World The Game, where it is one of the first tournament creatures that players can unlock, and Jurassic World Evolution 2. But it recently made an appearance in Apple TV's award-winning first season of Prehistoric Planet, which brought a fresh look at Dino Kyrus and other dinosaurs. The success was so great that Apple TV has confirmed that John Favreau's documentary will officially come back for a second season, which is scheduled to debut five new episodes in a week-long event starting on May 22nd of 2023. If you'd like to keep learning more about Dino Kyrus, then this video will feature a complete paleontological profile of the terrible hand in an attempt to recreate its environment in the game Jurassic World Evolution 2. Dinochirus is an omnivorous dinosaur that lived in the Nemec Formation, which is now southern Mongolia, during the late Cretaceous period, around 70 million years ago. What we know about Dinochirus now is that, for lack of a better word, that it was one of the most bizarre looking dinosaurs ever discovered. For starters, Dinochirus is the largest of the Ornithomimosaurs, measuring 36 feet long and weighing in at about 6.5 tons. The classification of Dinochirus was long uncertain, and it was initially placed in a theropod group Carnosauria, but similarities with Ornithomimosauria were soon noted. Though Dinochirus was a bulky animal, it had hollow bones that helped it save some weight. Nevertheless, its hind limbs and hip region indicated that the animal moved slowly. Its arms were among the largest of any bipedal dinosaur at 7.9 feet long with large blunt claws on its three finger pads. So far, Dinochirus and its related cousin, Therizinosaurus, possessed the longest forelimbs best known for any bipedal dinosaur. Each forelimb had large finger claws on the hands, which were well adapted to reaching around tall branches so that more leaves could be brought down to the mouth or for digging and gathering plants. The blunt claws of the feet could have helped the animal from sinking into the substrate when wading. Some early theories compare the forelimbs of Dinochirus to sloths, leading to theories that Dinochirus was a specialized climbing dinosaur that fed on plants and animals found in trees, but that has long been debunked. 
Its vertebrae had tall neural spines that formed a hump or sail along its back. As said earlier, some of these vertebrae bones were hollow, allowing the spine to be able to support such a large frame that would otherwise be impossible if the bones were solid and dense. This large frame may have protected it against predators such as tarbosaurs, especially since bite marks on Dinochirus bones have been discovered already. But in turn, it lost its running ability of the other small and nimble ornithomimosaurs. Another great thing that was found about Dinochirus through its bone is that its tail ended in pygostyle-like vertebrae, which indicate the presence of a fan of feathers. This hump and possible tail fan could have been used for display behavior in courtship in the similar way ostriches do today. The skull of Dinochirus measured about a little bit longer than 3 feet long, with a deep lower jaw with a white flattened beak that would have been covered by keratin. Its skull shape indicates that Dinochirus was an omnivore. If fed on a diet of mainly plants, but fish gills have been found in one specimen along with some gastrolids, which help it digest its food. The sclerotic rings of the eyes were relatively small in comparison with its skull length, which meant that it most likely was diurnal, or active during the day. On July 9, 1965, the Polish paleontologist Sofia Kalin Jaworowska made what would become marked as one of the most fascinating dinosaur discoveries of all time. During a joint Polish-Mongolian Academy of Science expedition into the Nemec Formation of Mongolia, she found the partial remains of a then unknown dinosaur, including a complete pair of forearms with some partially preserved vertebrae and ribs. What made everyone stop and pay attention to this find was that these arms measured about 2.4 meters long, and since these arms were formed in such a way that they seemed to come from a theropod dinosaur, they were the largest dinosaur arms of their kind. These holotype arms became part of a traveling exhibit of Mongolian dinosaur fossils touring various countries. Three years later, a report by paleontologist Kielin Jabrowska and Nadine Dovchen announced that the remains represented a new species of theropod dinosaur. The newfound specimen became the holotype of the only species within the genus, Dinochirus merifricus. Its genus name coming from the Greek meaning horrible hand due to the size and strong claws of the forelimbs. One of the most remarkable things about Dinochirus is its similarity to another bizarre theropod of Lake Cretaceous Central Asia, Therizinosaurus which was also endowed with unusually long arms capped by terrifyingly long clawed hands. The two families of theropods to which these dinosaurs belonged, Ornithomimids and Therizinosaurs, were closely related, and in any case, it is not inconceivable that Dinochirus and Therizinosaurs arrived at the same general body plan via the process of convergent evolution. The scarcity of known Dinochirus remains did not allow for a thorough understanding of the dinosaur for almost 50 years, with the scientific community describing it as the most mysterious and bizarre of dinosaurs. In 2012, paleontologists Philip R. Bell, Philip J. Curry, and Zhuang Nam Li announced the discovery of additional fossils of the holotype specimen. The discovery included fragments of the Australia bones found by Korean-Mongolian paleontological team that show bite marks on some of the Australia fragments. These bite marks were identified as belonging to Tarbosaurus, and it was theorized that this was the reason that the holotype specimen was in such a scattered state. Dr. Curry stated in an interview that it was policy of their team to investigate quarries after they had been looted and recover anything of significance and that finding any new Dinochirus fossils was cause for celebration, even without the poached parts. Skulls, claw bones, and teeth are often selectively targeted by poachers on the expense of the rest of the skeletons, which are often vandalized, due to their saleability. It had probably been looted after 2002, based on money left in the quarry. Almost 50 years after the discovery of its type fossils, Two new Dinochirus specimens were discovered once again in Mongolia, but only one could be pieced together after various fossils, including the skull, were recovered from poachers. The announcement of the discovery at the 2013 Meeting of Society of Vertebrae of Paleontology caused an uproar, a bit like a crowd of students learning that they were getting a pizza party and movie day at school. 
One of these fossils was slightly larger than the holotype, and it could be clearly identified as Dinochirus by its left forelimbs, and thus helped identify the earlier collected specimens as Dinochirus. The reunited skeleton was deposited at the Central Museum of Mongolian Dinosaurs in Ulaanbaatar, along with a Tarbosaurus skeleton which had also been brought back after being stolen. American paleontologist Thomas R. Holtz stated in an interview that the new Dinochirus remains look like the product of a secret love affair between a hydrosaur and Gallimimus. Combined with the stolen elements, both new species represented almost the entire skeleton of Dinochirus. This discovery sealed the deal. Dinochirus became classified as an ornithomimid or bird mimic dinosaur of late Cretaceous Central Asia, although much larger than classic ornithomimids like Ornithomimus and Gallimimus. The latter were sufficiently small and nimble to run across the plains at speeds of 30 miles per hour. The Dinochirus, on the other hand, couldn't even begin to match that pace. In 2015, paleontologist Akinobo Watanabe and his colleagues found that together with Archaeonithomimus and Gallimimus, Dinochirus had the most pneumatized skeleton among ornithomimosaurs. Pneumatization is thought to be advantageous for flight in modern birds, but its function in non-avian dinosaurs is not known with certainty. It has been proposed that pneumatization was used to reduce the mass of larger bones, that it was related to high metabolism, balanced during locomotion, or used for thermal regulation. Dinochirus died out approximately 66 million years ago during the KT extinction event. This event wiped out more than 90% of the non-avian dinosaurs still living at the end of the Cretaceous period, and scientists believe that this event was caused by a major catastrophic event that had planet-wide effects such as a massive asteroid impact or volcanic activity. Dinochirus is known from the 70 million year old Nemec Formation, one of the world's most productive dinosaur graveyards. This formation was formed by an inland delta, which is a river that drains into a shallow basin within the desert but evaporates rather than forming a lake. The Okavango Delta is a modern example of an inland delta, and it shows a large concentration of animals living in and around the swampy environment. Additionally, the rock facies of the Nemec Formation suggest the presence of streams and river channels and mudflats. Such large amounts of bodies of water give evidence of very humid climate. However, some rock deposits indicate the periods of drought in the area. Nonetheless, the river systems of this formation provided a suitable niche for Dinochirus with its omnivorous diet. Inside this environment, Dinochirus would have enjoyed the wide variety of plants and small animals including fish. It would have competed for trees with other large herbivorous dinosaurs such as its cousin, the Therizinosaurus, various seropods, and some of the tallest hydrosaurs. Dinochirus would have competed with those herbivores for higher foliage such as trees, however, it was able to feed on food that they could not. The unique shape of its skull indicated that Dinochirus had a more specialized diet than other dinosaurs. The beak was very similar to that of a duck and was likely adapted for cropping soft mosses and water vegetation. It also had a deep lower jaw that indicated a large tongue, which would have helped the animal in reaching for food material with the broad beak when foraging on the bottom of bodies of water. However, poor jaw muscles have indicated that Dinochirus had a weak bite force. The additional discovery of prehistoric fish fossils and scales among some gastroliths belonging to Dinochirus show that its beak-like mouth was perfectly suited for being an omnivore. Fossil flora from the earliest parts of the Cretaceous period consists mainly of ferns, conifers, cycads, and ginkgos. Angiosperms, also known as flowering plants, made their first appearance during this time, and so the Cretaceous period saw a dramatic change in plant life with the evolution of angiosperms and eventually grasses. Angiosperms steadily became increasingly prominent, and by the end of the Cretaceous period, they dominated vegetation in most parts of the world. But until the end of this period, these flowering plants were outnumbered by the conifers, ferns, cycads, and ginkgos surviving from the Jurassic period. Numerous herbivores, seropods, hadrosaurs, and theropods, including many other ornithomimosaurs and oviraptosaurs, lived in the swampy Nemec formation. Other theropods include sickle-clawed raptors and tyrannosaurs. Along with Dinochirus, the discovery of Therizinosaurus and Gigantoraptor show that three groups of herbivorous theropods, 
independently reached their maximum sizes in the late Cretaceous of Asia. The environment around the Nemec Formation where Dino Chiris made its home provided shelter for numerous organisms like mollusks, turtles, as well as a variety of other aquatic animals like fish and crocodilomorphs like the 20-foot long pair alligator. Tiny mammals were also common although only a few have been discovered. Additionally, many birds have been found like the Gorillinia, the Judinornis, as well as Tupiornis. Herbivorous dinosaurs of this formation include ankylosaurids such as the 3-ton Tarkia and the 7-foot long Pachycephalosaurian Bernocephale. Large herds of hadrosaurs like the Ceralophus and Barsboldia roamed the landscape while numerous seropod herds such as a 45 foot long Nemectosaurus and the slightly smaller Opisticolicotia shaped the landscape as they walked through it. Theropod dinosaurs with both omnivorous and herbivorous members include the similarly shaped Therizinosaurus, numerous oviraptosaurians like Elmosaurus, Nemectomaya, and Rachenia, and other ornithomimosaurs such as Anserimimus and Gallimimus. Carnivorous dinosaurs that lived alongside Dinochirus include the Tyrannosaurus such as enormous 37 foot long Tarbosaurus, its smaller relative the 20 foot long Allioramus, and the small and nimble 13 foot long Bagaradin, along with the 35 foot long Hugentoranus, which we know very little of. Numerous trodonids like the Borogovia, Cenobazar, and Tokisaurus coexisted with Dinochirus, although none of them would have been able to take on a Dinochirus. As one of the larger dinosaurs in its environment, Dinochirus probably only had to worry about other large theropod dinosaurs from fully grown, as Lake Cretaceous Asia seems to have been dominated by large tyrannosaurs such as the Tarbosaurus and Jujan Tyrannus. Tarbosaurus may have been a particular threat given that at least one of the Dinochirus ribs discovered at the fossil site of the original arms showed tooth marks that were likely caused by it. If this was active predation, or more simply a case of scavenging, however, it's simply impossible to say. In the Jurassic Park franchise, Dino Kyrus has made no appearance in any of the movies, only appearing in one website, Jurassic Park Institute on Dinopedia, and the video games Jurassic World The Game, which came out in 2016, Jurassic World Alive from 2018, and Jurassic World Evolution 2, having come out recently this year in 2023. Its related cousin, the Therizinosaurus, did make a major appearance on the film Jurassic World Dominion, so in a way one could say that Dinochirus was represented to Therizinosaurus as they share very similar features. While it did not feature in the Jurassic Park franchise, it did have a major appearance in the award-winning documentary series Prehistoric Planet. It is featured with a feathered body and duck bill wading through an Asian wetland in search of relief from pesky biting flies. Due to its great reception, Apple TV has confirmed that Prehistoric Planet will officially come back for a second season, which is scheduled to debut 5 new episodes in a week-long event starting on May 22nd, with Dino Kyrus rumored to make a return. Hey guys, welcome back to the park. As you can see here, I've gone ahead and updated myself to the new Jurassic World update. So with that comes the bigger map. I went ahead and split up the park. So right hand side, you're going to have our herbivores. Left hand side are carnivores. And with this new update, as I mentioned, we have to do Dino Kyrus dinosaur. And while it's not a carnivore, I've gone ahead and added it on the carnivore side just because, you know, it is a dangerous animal as we saw in Dominion with the Therizinosaurus. I am going to add Therizinosaurus in here as well because I've already done a video on Therizinosaurus. So we're going to add both Dinochirus and Therizinosaurus in this habitat because they both lived in a Okavango style, uh, you know, habitat style. So we're going to head, go ahead and recreate that you know a lot of floodplains so a lot of rivers marshes so it's gonna be um you know a lot of water to be dealt with um i do want to take advantage of this new update so let's go ahead and we're gonna try to add one of this as well as a log now the log should be pretty good here I also do want it to be in the middle 
because we are going to have those little areas become the areas where there's land um, and everywhere else is just going to be underwater and I think we're just going to add one more uh, actually let's just leave it at that for now let's go ahead and lower this um, terrain so we can go ahead and add our water and make these look like they're outside of the water and so being you know, like the only places where the dino chiris and the therosinosaurus can take a break from the water and you know not be soaked and be able to rest so we're gonna do that just make sure we don't have the slopes be outside of the enclosure just because you know that doesn't look too good for our guest as well as having a dinosaur on the loose what happened over here oh it's a gallimimus or archonithomimus um not sure how you got out it looks like he's back in um okay well that's a glitch that they're gonna have to fix <laughs> so back here let's go ahead and lower it just a bit let's pull our slope just a bit bigger and make this a bit lower however like i said we're actually gonna raise it just a bit because we do want these two to connect they're gonna be like our only flat areas um while everything else is gonna be underwater let's actually build the slope here just a bit more let's make sure it doesn't go outside of the lines here so as much as we can get it I don't want to do too much here because we have our little pathways over there for our nice little jeeps to go through and check on our habitats um, so I think we're good here let's go ahead and add our water and I have removed water so that's probably why it's not working and it's slowly gonna take us outside of the area but I think I might have to remove the line because that's actually actually no that's actually not bad um actually yeah let's go ahead and remove the log actually wait hold on let's see how much more water I can get in here no actually yeah you're right I might have to do a one of these because that's the only way it looks pretty cool so let's go ahead and do that Adios. Sorry, it didn't work out. Let's leave that though. Let's go ahead and build a dome wherever we have a chance to. I'm gonna have to find some terrain, so let me just do that real quickly. Let's flatten that terrain a little bit more. I'm not sure how much flat they wanted to be. We have to take away some water to so flatten it and then we'll put water back in it. Just want to be sure that I'm able to place it down. Okay, perfect. Um, and complete connection. Let's get back to our water. Let's see how much water we can add here. Come on. There you go. This is what I wanted. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's make it a bit smaller. There we go. Now it's gone outside the area. That's fine. We'll fix that right now. But pretty much what I wanted just happened. There we go. It's even better now. So just try to spread it around as much as you can. Obviously try not to get outside the area. So what we're gonna do what we're gonna do here is we go ahead and fix our terrain. We're gonna flatten it. No, it looks like we can. We're gonna have to remove some water. Whoa, 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 that was not the right one. over here as well looks like I'm 
we'll put some trees in there to, um, you know, kind of block out a lot of the dry areas. That's one way we can fix it. And that way you don't have to deal with this outside of your um, enclosure and have it look really bad for your guest. It's one or the other. You please your guest or you please your dinos. So let's find this train. There we go. Boom. Now let's go ahead and add our trees. So we're going to use a lot of this because you know it's Okavango Delta. So let's go ahead and add it here. They're not going to be able to see. So let's go ahead and take a couple of these away. And just go ahead and keep adding them around. Not too much. And let's switch over to our Temskia. We had some ferns during this time. So let's go ahead and add these. These are actually look pretty nice. And then after that, let's switch over to our Psycats. And I'm gonna go ahead and add it. You know, we're gonna pretend this is a deep part. So these is gonna be like our shallow area. And our deep part is obviously gonna be darker than the rest. So we're gonna do add that. Since this is more shallow, we're going to add a bit of sand of this. And we're going to do the same thing over here. This represents like, you know, it's shallow, it's not that deep. And when you have that, just go ahead and plot some plants in there. Some seed plants, angiosperms, you could say, are represented here. They're not really quite angiosperms, but you know, it's all we have for now. And we can go ahead and finish with a bit of the leafy climbers, at least on this dry area. That way it doesn't look too plain. Mm, I'm not going to add a lot of, you know, dirt. Just because this is Okavango Basin, so it's, you know, very, very humid, very wet, wetlandish. So very hardly any, any, any sort of um, dry lands that we'll be encountering here. Um, let me go ahead and just go ahead and brush it again with some side cats. Those always look really nice. They're like the ones that stand up the most because of how colorful they are. Uh, but aside from that, I think we'll be done. We're just going to finish off with the rocks actually. And let's go ahead and do some taiga and some temperate. Let's go ahead and add it. And I love this thing. I don't have to be switching around, randomize it, which is pretty cool because we don't want to really, you know, materialistic or, or you know, human made looking habitat. We want to make it look natural, which is what we're doing here. So, which is a really great tool that they added. And let's switch over to this darker rock over here, mix it with these two. And after this, I'll go ahead and show you a small little, you know, B roll clip with the Dino Kyrus along with some. There's Unisaurus roaming around here, just having a good old, good old, good old time. Let me know what you guys think, and let me know what you would do, or what you would change. Hope you guys have a good one, and I'll see you in the next one. Being so weirdly and oddly shaped, Dino Kyrus is one of the more popular dinosaurs in mainstream media. This bizarre looking dinosaur with huge clawed hands like a sloth, a beaked head like a duck, and a hump like a camel makes Dino Kyrus a not so beautiful but deadly addition to your Jurassic Park. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. See you in the next one.